Recording in progress. Hello. <laughs> You're too loud. You don't get such a loud signal in Ravi Krishna, right? So. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, as you know, uh, last few years have been pretty exciting for gravitational waves. There has been the detection of gravitational waves with, in LIGO, and now there is this strong evidence which was found with the pulsar timing array. And hopefully, with the with all that data together, there will be a from five sigma detection, and we are all looking forward to it. Uh, so today's speaker is Professor Balchand uh, Joshi from NCR, and as you know, and well, we. We have been here for a while, and we, we don't need any introduction for him. And he is right in the middle of the whole analysis, starting from the inception of this detection. So we are going to hear from him that what exactly happened with, with, the, uh, uh, with the data and the instrument and so on. So I, I never... I mean, to me, he was always like PCJ. He's there. So today, because of this introduction, I looked up his other details and fortunately found it online. So yeah, he did his uh, bachelor's in IIT Rurki and then uh, master's, uh, master of physics in uh, IIT Bombay. And then I think ever since you have been working in uh, GMRT. So he has. Uh, I think the amount of time he is working in GMRT is certainly beyond the age of most of the people in this room. And as Sanjeev Durandar these days says, probably even your parents' age. <laughs> okay, so without wasting any more time, Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Sanjeev. Uh, yes, I have been around here for quite some time from the early days of Ayuka, actually. Uh, so, first time I uh, sort of came to this part of the university was with Russell Gray was organizing this uh, science congress in Pune uh, University when the idea of NCRA and then got to place. So, and of course, I think you need that kind of timeline for for pulsar timing and experiments which I'm going to talk about. So thanks very much uh, for uh, inviting me and uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to be back in Bhaskara 3 uh, after a long post-pandemic time. This is the first time, uh, in fact, uh, Third time I am giving a face-to-face -face talk, usually it's all been online. So it's a pleasure to be here and thanks very much to Ayuka for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to discuss our recent results. In the beginning, I would just like to uh, state that many of the results which I'm going to present are uh, basically a work uh, of uh, really hard work and long uh, night hours of many young early research careers from India and Japan in our Indian Pulsar Timing Array collaboration and also our European colleagues in European Pulsar Timing Array and I would like to acknowledge them right in the beginning of this uh, talk. Okay. 
So uh, let me begin by taking a historical look at uh, the messengers which we have, which we know of today. And there are typically, there are four messengers which have been used in astronomy to explore the universe around us. And uh, these messengers have opened up at different points of time and windows in their spectrum have opened up at different points of the time. The earliest was almost 400 years back you know, when uh, Galileo used instruments to observe invisible light, which, which took another 300 years to actually open the long wavelength window of the electromagnetic spectrum in 1932, followed subsequently by X-rays and gamma rays, 48 and 61 and so on. So it was a long duration over which the electromagnetic messenger uh, sort of uh, opened up. By contrast, the other three messengers, the cosmic ray messenger, the neutrino messenger, and now the gravitational wave messenger are much more recent. And uh, it should be noted that uh, these uh, latter three messengers have actually kept hand in hand with complicated detectors, more advanced technology, and more advanced processing, which has made uh, these uh, windows to open up much faster than the electromagnetic uh, window. And uh, one should just note here in passing that the gravitational messenger window was detected direct observational proof just 80 years back. And now we have a new part of this uh, window opening up uh, within eight years or so. So uh, essentially, as far as the gravitational wave messenger is concerned, and that is the messenger which I'm going to talk about, and the long wavelength counterpart of the gravitational wave messenger, which uh, the window was opened eight years back. From the proposal uh, to the actual first direct observational proof, it took almost 150 years. When you were you say, proposed in the 1860s, the existence of gravitational wave and the uh, and it took a very circuitous route to the Weber cylinders, to the interferometers, and so on, to finally the detection 2015 uh, by the laser interferometry gravitational wave observation. Uh, but subsequently, in the next eight years, specifically this year, last month, five pulsar timing array experiments, the European pulsar timing array, Indian <coughs> pulsar timing array, the North American nanohertz gravitational wave observatory nanograph, the Parkes pulsar timing array, and the Chinese pulsar timing array. These uh, these uh, experiments have actually provided the first emerging evidence. I won't call it as a strong evidence, as Sanjeev put it, but emerging evidence of ultra low frequency or ultra long wavelength gravitational waves by providing a proof of uh, uh, in the form of detection of a common red spectrum across an ensemble of pulsars, as well as an expected characteristic form of spatial cross correlation across these pulsars. So those are the two main points which, will, which I will illustrate during my talk to sort of show why we feel that uh, this particular spectrum of the gravitational waves we have detected. Of course, the spectrum which we are talking about, this is the gravitational wave spectrum, lies in the nanohertz frequency range, and the spectrum uh, extends from attohertz to almost hundreds of hertz and so on. And the most likely uh, source here is going to be supermassive black hole binary systems. So what are these super hole, uh, supermassive black hole binary systems? We already know that there are supermassive black hole, uh, black hole systems at the centers of galaxy. In 2019, in M87, and in 20, recently, in our own galaxy, EHT has provided us an image which sort of indicates to us a proof that there is a six billion solar mass black hole at the center of M87 and about four and a half million solar mass at the center of our galaxy. So we know from this that black holes do reside, supermassive black holes, do reside at the centers of the galaxies. So what happens when two such galaxies merge? When they merge, there is a likelihood that you will also form a supermassive black hole binary system. And that is what is sort of schematically illustrated in this particular diagram, where post-galaxy merger, 
the dynamical friction in the centers of the galaxy, or the dynamical friction in the galaxy drives the two black holes towards the center of the galaxy. They sink to the center of the galaxy and they become gravitationally bound as a, a supermassive black hole binary. For separations, orbital separation less than a parsec and so, the evolution of this binary is purely gravitationally dominated. That is, it evolves by loss of gravitational radiation. And this phase can continue for a long period of time with orbital periods of the order of decades or years. And that is exactly the universe of that is the nanohertz frequency where the pulsar timing array experiments are sensitive. So we are talking of this particular part of the evolution of these uh, supermassive black hole binary systems. Of course, beyond that, there will be coalescence, which will form the higher frequency range in the sun, and also burst in memory and so on, which I'll not do. <laughs> Yes. Oh, that, that is the burst with memory. So, oh, memory. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's the uh, the coalescence phase of the spiral. That will leave a permanent deformation in the space time. That the PTA is sensitive. LIGO is not. PTA and LISA are sensitive. But I'll not go into that. I have mostly confined this uh, parsec kind of range of orbit because that's where the continuous wave come from the system. And what we are, what we have detected is the continuous wave, not the burst. Okay, we don't have any proof that there are supermassive black hole binary systems in the universe, but there are candidates. And this is one of the best candidates, uh, Blazar known as OJ287, which uh, my colleague Gopu Kumar, his collaborators and his students have been extensively studying for the last decade or so. And this, the proof for that comes from, uh, from electromagnetic bursts which you see uh, on, say, uh, spacings of 12 years and so on, which gives you an idea that probably the orbital period of the system is 12 years. And the electromagnetic signatures are consistent with the supermassive black hole scenario. And there are others of this study. So such systems do exist, and they are the main source for, for the PTA. So, uh, PTA detector, which I'm talking about. Now, uh, one can calculate the characteristic strain from a single individual supermassive black hole binary system, and that is given by an expression here, where M is the total churn mass and Q is the mass ratio. So, the maximum signal which you will get will be for the equal mass uh, supermassive black hole binary system, which is given by expression here. And if you plug in the numbers, the typical strain value. Strain is the dimensional best number of the amount by which the space time is stretching and squeezing. That number is of the order of similar sensitivity as all the PTA experiments as of now. So, if you look at the galaxy surveys and try to figure out the possibility of uh, galaxies with supermassive black hole binary systems higher than these jet masses. It's very rare that you will find an isolated or individual system which could be detected by a pulsar array experiment. So it's very unlikely. It's very unlikely that we were going to detect an individual supermassive black hole binary system. But what was more likely is to find a signal which is an incoherent sum of the ensemble of several billions and billions of these supermassive black hole binary systems. And that sum could form a uniform isotopic background, which is what, what is known as stochastic gravitational wave background. And that is the source which one is attacking. This is very different from LIGO, where the background is yet to be detected, but usual sources have been detected. Here it's just the opposite, that we are looking for a background. And that, the strain, due to uh, such a sum is given by an expression here, where the different uh, constituents to this strain are listed here. But I would like you to focus more on the term here, which is the so-called residence time. And this residence time is an important key concept in trying to figure out what kind of signal I would see. So first of all, this is a sum of uh, gravitational wave from a large number of supermassive black hole binary systems. Each of these binaries will have different orbital periods, which means they will radiate gravitational waves at different frequencies. 
The residence time is essentially the time which is spent in a given frequency by a particular supermassive black hole binary system. Now, the way the in spiral, the ground, if you assume that there is a continuous distribution of supermassive black hole binaries, where the in spiral is dominated by gravitational wave radiation, then you will find that the time spent by a binary in a higher frequency wind will be relatively much more shorter than the time spent by a binary in a lower frequency. So, in other words, you will have uh, you will have more binaries in lower frequencies and less binaries in a high frequency. And this residence time is the dominant factor in this equation, which determines the shape of the spectrum, which uh, which the stochastic gravitational wave background could have. And that spectrum looks something like this. And this was uh, actually computed by Jaffe and Baker down back. And that is the expression that the spectrum would have a strain of the value of similar value to that uh, earlier thing which I showed with a spectral index of 2 by 3. And that is also plotted as a dashed line here in this particular plot. The shaded regions are in case the, uh, the in spiral is affected by other things like the last pass I problem and so on. I will not go into the details of that. But that's what one is looking for. So obviously, if you are looking for uh, frequencies of nanohertz, you are looking for periods of years and decades. So since the sources are of that uh, uh, that type, the wavelengths which you are talking about are exactly what the title of my talk said: ultra long wavelength gravitational waves. And you would need a detector with a characteristic arm, which is of the order of parsecs. So you can't have a. Can I that you should so this is um, also there is a volume of the yeah that function that function that is the occupation function but it so happens that the dominant part in the shape is coming from here so this is where the frequency is coming in. here of course the assumption is also that there is a continuous distribution we know that would not be the case. We know that there will be a redshift distribution, yes. which, uh, which is exactly here. These are terms there. Okay. So that will, of course, uh, modify the shape of the spectrum somewhat, but the overall spectrum is dominated by the residence star. So there are other, other things. For example, I assume circular binaries. If you have eccentric binaries, then the gravitational wave will have uh, powers at frequencies other than the fundamental. And that is what is given by terms like that. So there are other terms in this, this expression which we can safely ignore because the residence time uh, uh, thing uh, basically dominates. Yeah. So the mass, mass spectrum also will be maybe yes, 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 yes. And in fact, many of these things are very uncertain because you don't have very good astronomical measurements to constrain any of this. And in fact, the hope is the reverse that PTA would end up constraining some of this. Uh, very wishful hope, but nevertheless a hope. Okay. So you, uh, since you need, yeah. Volume term only tell you. Uh, you are saying that that uh, it says amplitude, whereas the spectral Shape. frequency depends yeah. depends yes. on the precisely precisely. So then, how do you know that? Like in general, LIGO, we know that uh, depending upon sensitivity, we also know that that. That the volume which you are actually looking for your source. Hmm. Here, if I want to know, like, uh, suppose your uh, sensitivity is decided at some value, hmm. how do I know that I am detecting one binary up to some volume? No, so this is a background. Yeah, even background. This is a background. So it could be it could be from, it could be cosmological. But, but, and in fact, this is just one model, by the way. Okay. There can be other origins for the same spectrum. There could be uh, origins like uh, cosmic superstates. Yeah, yeah. 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 yes. Depending upon what sensitivity or what one, so we say that you integrate only light coming up to some size. No, so this is an integration for the entire redshift. So you are considering all the supermassive black hole binary system which are there. And obviously, you are assuming that they are at different stages of their evolution. So the the orbital, uh, the frequency band in which they fall would be different. And of course, the evolution of the uh, lasers would also factor into that. 
Because as they change, <laughs> as long as you have it's different shape will then depend upon the shift and the other heading keywords. Yeah. If you say that the uh, uh, sign detects the special shape, if I put the binary at different distance, yes. I have to worry about the possibility of the dilation. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, in principle, if you know exactly that occupation function, you could probably have a better picture for this. But the uh, since we are talking of gravitational wave dominated in spiral, all those things are actually sort of washed out. But, so you are going to stick it to a smaller. Yeah, it's, it's only one per second. So uh, the other things may matter earlier. In fact, there are many other things which will matter. You know, the dynamical friction itself would change the evolution time scale of the battery. So you may actually see a turnover. So at low frequency, there is an expectation that there will be a turnover in the spectrum. So we have not yet reached that part of the spectrum. But someday, that turnover will constrain some of the things. So there is a lot of astrophysics which can be constrained from there. But for the for today's purpose, we are only sticking to the, the late stage evolution of the binary system. Okay, sorry. So the slides will keep moving. So, <laughs> so don't get confused if uh, uh, in the discussion they have gone. Okay. So, yeah. So essentially, we are talking of uh, wavelengths which are very, very long, of the order of parsecs. So you need a detector which would have an arm length of that kind of thing. And that kind of a detector can only be a galactic wide detector. So pulsar timing array is a galactic wide detector which employs a collection of uh, very good blocks, <coughs> millisecond pulsars. And uh, of course, because we are talking of wavelengths of the order of, uh, we are talking of periods of the order of years to decades, you need also a campaign which will run over decades. That is one, one of the hard things to do this particular experiment. In fact, three generations of astronomers have gone through before there has been a computation. So that's an important point to sort of uh, remember. So uh, I just introduced you to the sources which the pulsar timing array are sensitive to, the spectrum of these sources, and why that spectrum requires a detector like pulsar timing. So that's the key points from those previous slides. Of course, I have been mentioning pulsars, pulsars, pulsar timing array. So what are pulsars? We can do this detection of these gravitational waves by measuring tiny deviations in the frequency of these stars. And the only stars which we know which produce some kind of a frequency are pulsars. So radio pulsars are compact and massive, highly magnetized rotating neutron stars. And their rotation is perfectly stable because of their compact and massive nature. So they have, they make the best celestial blocks. And as you can see, the periodicity of the pulses shown in that animation is very, very remarkably blocked. And because they are the best celestial blocks, they are used in this experiment. About 3,500 of these pulsars are known as of today, but only a small tiny subset, which is shown here in the period period derivative diagram of the pulsar astronomy, which have very low magnetic fields, are used for this experiment. Primarily because they are the best amongst the best of the pulsar blocks, with a stability of one part in, say, 100 quantillion and so on. And that is why. Uh, it makes these millisecond pulsars the most important uh, probes for uh, nanohertz gravitation, detection of nanohertz gravitation. So, how many are there in that block? Like, some of them must so, have been. So, the total uh, population as of today is about 500 to 550 millisecond pulsars. It keeps growing every, uh, every year. But most of them are far away pulsars. And some of them are not very well tiny. They have been mostly discovered in the last decade or so. So they are not included in the sample. Uh, of the overall 500, you have about one fifth, which is about 100 per millisecond pulsars, which are being used. And really speaking, all those 100 are also not very good. So we restrict ourselves to a much smaller sample of 20 or so. But is there a chance that the number is? Okay. Yeah, so when the square kilometer array becomes operational in 2028, 20, 2029, the next decade or so, this uh, the total pulsar population itself should increase to something like 20, 25,000. And the millisecond pulsar population should increase to 5,000. So maybe you may be left with, say, 800, 900 pulsars to be used, which is very important if you want to have high sensitivity 
ultra uh, low frequency gravitational waves to it. So, what I mean is that you have data for all of them. Yes. Some of them are huge, but is it possible to use the existing data to include more, more pulsars? So, it's, uh, many of them have been discovered in the last 20 years, right? So, and many of them have not really been tested. So, as I will show later on, it's important for the precision of the experiment. This is a high precision experiment. So, it is important to first know your probes themselves. That makes sense. Okay, I see. So, eventually, yes, the longer run, more and more pulsars are being included. In fact, when uh, Park started, they started with 20 and Nanograph started with about 30 or so. Nanograph has expanded to 67 now. And uh, so, this number keeps growing. But how many of them are really useful is a question which within our community also will be the model. Okay, so to be able to detect the gravitational wave, you need to get very high precision measurements. And that is done by using a technique known as pulsar timing. So pulsar timing basically is a technique in which you compare the prediction of pulse time of arrival from a rotational model of the star. I said the clock-like mechanism of the pulsar is because of its rotation. So you find out a predicted time of arrival of the pulse from the rotational model and compare it with the observed uh, time of arrival, keeping track of total number of rotations of the star. This is schematically what is shown. So if you have an uncertainty in any of the periods, let's say the rotational period, you will see that uncertainty goes with time. And as your time baseline becomes longer and longer, the precision and that is the key to some of the most unprecedented precision measurements in pulsar astronomy. Usually astronomy will talk a factor of two. Here we can go down to centimeters and so on. So this is a very powerful technique. And you can know everything about the pulsar just by doing timing. So these are four illustrations. So if you want to refine the position of the pulsar, if you have some uncertainty, you see an annual sinusoid and from that you can get the answer. If there is proper motion of the pulsar, this is how the signature looks like. If the orbital period of the pulsar is not very well determined, this is how the signature looks like. If the interstellar medium dispersion is not correct, this is how the signature looks like. This is the data on 1909 minus 3744 from the second pulsar, uh, data from GMRT at six other telescopes in the world. So GMRT is sitting here, and in the rest, this is parts and other telescopes, and so on. So, okay. so you over a long period of time, you can refine your model of the pulsar, and that is what gives you the overall precision to detect the really tiny gravitational wave which we have. The pulsar model involves many things. It involves the spin parameters of the pulsar, it involves the positional parameters of the pulsar, the dispersion and scattering in the interstellar medium, the binary Keplerian parameters as well as post-Keplerian parameters. The system is relativistic and also environmental things like solar wind and so on and so forth. And if you have everything incorporated in your model, then you, are, you will be able to predict the pulse exactly and match it with the observed pulse time of arrival. And what you should be left with is pure white noise, which represents the measurement noise in your, uh, in your uh, experiment. Any systematic in this residual, that is the predicted time of arrival minus the observed time of arrival, that is called as timing residual. Any systematic in that is telling you about unknown parameters. And the low frequency variation uh, introduced into the periodicity of the pulsars by the <coughs> long wave gravitational wave appears as a systematic. Of course, it appears at a much, much smaller order of magnitude than other noise pulses. So this is the basic idea behind detection of the gravitational wave. And historically, Sarzin was the first person who proposed using pulsars. Uh, he said that one possible technique would involve recording the change in the frequency of electromagnetic radiation in the gravitational wave field. For pulses of electromagnetic radiation, this effect will be manifested as a change in the period between the pulses. So this is what he said in his uh, 1978 paper. And interestingly, in that paper, he also said that the best way to find this is if there exist in the universe double superstars of periods of several years. And this was at a time, it was a conjecture, this was at a time when supermassive black hole binaries were not even thought about. Okay, so, so this was really sort of visionary on the part of Sarzin to say that. Dr. immediately later on, 
wrote another paper in which he actually uh, sort of calculated an expression of exactly what uh, Sarvin had said and related it in terms of the in terms of the uh, the amplitude and which paid, and he used uh, the timing residuals defined by this expression to set a limit on the closure density of the universe, which he got a number from relatively very imprecise measurement of these three pulsars in those days, fairly close to, to what uh, you would expect. So these were the initial two works which uh, sort of uh, proposed the idea of pulsar timing. But it was Donald Baker who for the first time proposed that you can actually detect the nanohertz gravitational waves by using an ensemble of pulsars by trying to <laughs> interpret the timing residuals in terms of the signature in, imprinted, uh, which is on the timing residuals, which is correlated across the ensemble of widely separated pulsars. So if you have pulsars in different directions of the sky, the correlation would actually tell you about the gravitational wave. And uh, Richard Manchester in Australia, for the first time, set a, a systematic experiment, the Parkes Pulsar Timing Array, to begin the uh, PTA science somewhere around 2002 and so on and so forth. So these are the four gentlemen actually sort of led to the development of this uh, field. So the key concept, or the key property of a Pulsar Timing Array is that the signal from a gravitational wave background would be correlated across pulsars, while that from the other noise processes would not be. So here the gravitational wave signal is competing with many other noise processes. The other noise processes will be uncorrelated, but the gravitational wave will be correlated across. Schematically, this can be seen in a diagram like that. And then PTA will function as a galactic scale gravitational wave detector. So just sort of explain this a little bit more. So what the uh, perturbation in the space-time uh, would do to the pulses is that the gravitational waves will retard or advance the travel time of the pulses. And this retardation or advancement would lead to a fractional change in frequency, which is given by an expression here, where the angles are what are shown this uh, particular diagram here. The gravitational wave propagating in the bend direction, Earth is at the origin of the coordinate system, and your pulses are making an angle theta with that. Psi is the polarization angle. Gravitational wave, and this expression has two terms uh, where there is information about gravitational waves encoded. These are at two different times and two different space coordinates. One is at Earth, which is known as a second term, and the other one is at the pulsar, which is the initial term. Now, the key thing which one needs to sort of understand here is are what is listed here in terms of what this correlation would look like. Okay. First of all, one would expect that since you are looking at different pulsars, they will have their own rotation rates, they will have their own noise sources. So the correlation uh, for a background on the pulsar term is not equal, so you should neglect that. Whereas the gravitational waves, the vicinity of the Earth will leave a sizable correlation for the background. So that's the first assumption. Now if you make that assumption and neglect the pulsar term, that means that the correlation which you expect to be reduced by Roughly half because half the term is gone. More importantly, the quadrupolar nature of the gravitational waves means that the shape of the spectrum in terms of separation between maximal and minimal correlation is determined by, by the quadrupolar nature of that. <clears throat> also, pulsars emitting in the same direction as the propagation of the gravitational wave will have a larger response than the puls uh, pulsars which are emitting in a direction opposite to that. And finally, uh, all these are uh, valid for gravitational wave propagating in the z direction, but finally your response would be an average of gravitational waves propagating over the entire direction. So if you take these four factors into account, you can mathematically derive the, the form or the shape of the correlation function, which is, for those of you who are interested is done in a very nice manner in this particular paper. I should also caution at this point that there can be other reasons for correlation. And the simplest of that could be an instrumental noise in your radio telescope. So the clock or something can be correlated across each pulsar. There can be other uh, reasons why, for example, the solar system enters in the tiny uh, technique in some sense. So the solar system entry itself can lead to a correlation. But the important thing to note is that this 
is a quadripolar signature, whereas these effects are either monopolar or dipolar. So you can, in principle, separate these effects, these correlations, from the correlation due to gravitation. So I think that's another point which one should just keep in mind. Right. Right, but uh, uh, that would not take away the solar system. Ah, the solar system would not take away. So instrumental, the monopolar uh, nature can probably be taken care of. Actually, that was a big debate last year when we were finding a monopole signal. We still have a monopole signal, but it's not seen at any point. But uh, it was traced to a clock issue in fancy radio telescope. So, so there are lots of other details which one has to worry about. But you are right. So you can actually uh, sort of uh, separate it out by looking at different instruments. Dipolar, you cannot. So, so dipolar has played a huge role in the last 10 years because we have refined the solar system ephemeris by a huge factor. Uh, solar system uh, very center to a 50 meter precision. Which the NASA's the JPL ephemeris never did. Okay. That was a big, big no no for almost six years before we could actually. So, all these terms do sort of matter. And that does come in the line of track. Yes, yeah. Because uh, the Jupiter's orbit is 12 years. So if you have a 12 year orbital thing, that will, uh, the center of mass of sun changing by that much could factor into this. Okay, so, uh, so as I said, emission term is uncorrelated and the earth term is correlated. So for this geometry, where you have two pulsars separated by angle eta, the correlation has a expression, uh, the, uh, the expression for the correlation has a form like this. And that is also plotted as a function of the angle between the two particular pulsars. This function, the spatial correlation function, which I keep calling a spatial correlation function, is known as Helix and Down overlap function. And there are several derivations of this. The original one is Helix and Down, but other people have done better derivations of that. And this is the characteristic signature of which one is looking at. So, in other words, in order to be able to claim that you have detected nanohertz gravitational wave, you need to have two different things in your uh, harmony. You need to be able to show that you are detecting gravitational wave background by finding out that your spectra, which you are detecting, has a spectral index of 2 by 3 in strain. Okay. That strain then translates into timing residuals. So when you do that tra translation, this becomes 13 by 3. Okay, so just keep that in mind that the spectral index, which I'll be referring to later on, will have a different value, but they are both equivalent. And the second thing is that if you are employing a pulsar timing array, you should detect a spatial correlation of the helix and now of the quadrupolar correlation. So as long as you get both of these, you can say that yes, you have detected the correlation of the background. And this requires details of timing. All of the you could detect. Yeah, you could detect, but the expectation from astrophysics is that uh, you could not have that because even the non-supermassive uh, black hole scenarios, first like extremes or ultra like dark matter, all those have similar kind of spectra. And actually, that is one of the things which are new questions which have arisen from these things. I have come to <coughs> measurement. Yeah, measurement is broadband, certainly. But uh, there is, of course, uh, the jaggedness in the spectrum, which is already telling you that uh, somehow the supermassive black hole binary systems are there, which I showed earlier, because the, the power is not much at those frequencies. So if, if, the, if it was flat, we would have detected it long back. So it's certainly not flat. Yeah, I mean, there is a general amplitude versus if it was flat, but slightly lower, it would probably get the same scenario. Yes. And, uh, so, uh, when we were talking of upper limits, the argument which you are saying was valid. But today, I think that's no longer valid. Okay. So, uh, I told you about PTAs and the required things about PTA. So, let's start with a PTA experiment. Let's start with our own, the Indian Pulsar Diamond Array experiment. The fact that GMRT can be used for this experiment is, dates back to 1990, right? There was a conference in Bangalore and followed, following that, a lot of pulsar astronomers visited GMRT. And Don Becker was also here, and he, at that time, this idea was very new. So, not many people were taking Don Becker very seriously. 
He told Govind that GMRT is a very sensitive instrument and I think this would be a very nice project for that. And that got Govind very excited. So he called us all for and said we should start preparing to do this kind of experiment. So of course it took us 20 years to reach the precision which he wanted. But nevertheless, I think uh, in some sense it was the vision of uh, late Professor Govind Saru which sort of inspired us to build the instrumentation which was required to reach this kind of process. So I would sort of say that in some sense, it was his idea of thinking big and doing harder experiments that led us to be this direction. But the actual idea of Indian Pulsar Timing Array came in a discussion with uh, Dick Manchester in a meeting in Bangalore organized by Bala, uh, who also was involved in Indigo in those days and later on in the LIGO experiment and so on. So this was a meeting uh, for the space interferometer, and there Dick had come, and both of us had discussions, and he was very encouraging, and he encouraged us to start an experiment, even though we were 10 years late. Yeah. So other experiments had started earlier, but he said that GMRT can still, or OT can still make a mark. So we started uh, with a feasibility experiment in 2013, and encouraged with that, uh, Goku Kumar Manjari and two more students, and myself, we started a pilot experiment with Kuti Radio Telescope at the Legacy GMRT in 2015. And as the GMRT was being upgraded and the upgrade was coming online, Yashwant and myself, we also started testing the precision of GMRT to do this kind of experiment uh, soon afterwards. And encouraged by these early efforts, we decided to formally constitute PTA and start an experiment in 2018 using the update. That's what is going on. From an initial strength of about five people, we have grown to a collaboration of 40 people with several uh, UG master students as well as PhD students and members both from India and Japan. And we measure, we monitor regularly 15 to 22 pulsars, this is a little bit older, every 14 days. And the main goal of the experiment is to characterize and distinguish the slowly varying with the stellar Use files from gravitational wave signal. And I will explain why. Because GMRT is a low frequency instrument, so we are best suited to do this. And the reason is that the pulsars are steep spectrum sources and they are much brighter at lower frequencies than higher frequencies. Moreover, the interstellar medium uh, leads to dispersion and scattering, which are strong functions of frequency, so they are dominant at the frequencies of GMRT which means that these effects can be best characterized by the NPT experiment rather than other experiments. The other important thing is that both these dispersive and scattering effects, they vary over months and years. So in some sense, the, uh, the, the, effect, the effect of this in pulsar timing is covariant with the gravitational wave signal. So if you want to enhance the sensitivity of your pulsar timing to gravitational wave, you to sort of take away these things. And the best place to do that is at lower frequency. And GMRT actually was perfect for this. So our effort uses the unique niche capabilities of the GMRT. First of all, we are targeting the low frequency range, which is what is important for this, 300 to 800 megahertz. Secondly, GMRT is the most powerful or most sensitive instrument to do this because we are using phase arrays with the new wide band fields in that frequency range to that. But even more importantly, GMRT's interferometer nature means that we can use GMRT as two co-located 75 meter telescopes using its multi-band, multi-subarray and multi -band feature. And this means that we can do two frequency concurrent simultaneous observations to measure these effects very, very effectively with high precision. So these niche capabilities are very useful for precision DM measurements and characterizing the effects of interstellar medium for precision timing and complementing other tools. And just to show an example of that, uh, the precision which we have achieved is unprecedented. We last year published our first uh, Indian pulsar timing array data minus one, which included 14 pulsars shown here by the red stars and with a significant overlap with the other PTA experiments, which are the gray circles here. And in this data release, we, for the first time, pre presented the dispersion measure time series from low frequencies. In this plot, the x-axis is the MJV, and the y-axis on the right-hand side is 
dispersion measure of each of the pulsar after subtracting median dispersion. <coughs> Essentially, this is the variation of dispersion measure. And this is up to the fourth decimal. And as you can see, in some of the pulsars, you can go down to a precision of fifth decimal, which is unprecedented in pulsar astronomy. No dispersion measures have ever been measured to the precision that we can measure. <coughs> and that should also tell you, like for the pulsars like these, that without that precision, you will not see the variations which you have seen in this particular case. So this puts NPTA in the best place to characterize the ISM noise and remove it from the data to be able to enhance the sensitivity. And I'll show further example how this ability has been. So this paper was published uh, last year, uh, somewhere around September, in which we released three and a half years of data. Now we are working on five-year data release, which would come out uh, in January or so. So that was Indian Pulsar Dynamics experiment, but that's not the only experiment. Actually, we are one of the youngest experiments. The oldest is the past Pulsar Timing Array experiment with 18 years of data, 30 millisecond pulsars. The European Pulsar Timing Array, 25 millisecond pulsars, and the nanogram, 67 millisecond pulsars, and 15 years of data. So we are the fourth experiment with about 20 millisecond pulsars, and now about seven years of data. There are two emerging experiments also which are coming up. One is in China, which is using FAST, and the other one is using the media. All these experiments, they contribute their data together and pull their data together in what is known as International Pulsar Timing Array Consortium. And the purpose of pulling on this data is after each PTA publishes its own result, we add our data together. And this combined data is much more sensitive than the data of the PTA. So two data release of IPTA have already taken place, and currently the third data release is ongoing. Hopefully, it will come out next year. So that answers which nanogram used for this sixty-seven. Yes. So did they use the dispersion measure from? No, they didn't. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't. But now in the DR three, everybody is going to use our dispersion measure. Yes. So in fact, one of the things which is coming out in the comparisons of the results is I'll show you show that later on that. The dispersion measures were important for them and they have not used. So they could have been more sensitive than what they were. Okay, so a little bit about the data. So that is how the timing residual data looks. This is from the UJMRT data for 1909-3744. The black points are the high frequency points, 1260 to 1460, and the red points are 300 to 500 stars. You can see that the, from the scale on the y-axis that already you are going into tens of microseconds and the expected gravitational wave amplitude is few tens of nanoseconds. So you are already three orders of magnitude worse. And all this is happening because there is a noise source called dispersion, which is there in the data. If you remove that dispersion, as is done on the plot here, then you are able to significantly improve that. Now, again, the measurement noise in this data is also miscalculated. So if you do a better calculation of the measurement noise, which we call as white noise, as I'll explain later on, this goes down even further. So you need to do a detailed noise analysis to be able to extract the real juice out of this particular data. If you look at the data just like that, it is completely useless. So you both need precision and you need a very good analysis. And that analysis involves removing systematic deviations in residual because of various types of noise sources. The simplest noise source is, noise source is deterministic, that is your model, rotational or whatever, binary model itself is not correct, and that is leading to a systematic. That of course will become lesser and lesser as time goes, as your baseline increase, this becomes smaller and smaller. But then there are stochastic noise sources. The simplest of that to understand is the measurement noise, which is because of the signal to noise ratio of your pulse from your telescope. And these are characterized by two different white noise parameters known as E fat and E fat. They are white noise because their power is there across all the frequency. They have a flat spectrum. And while these are important, these are not as important as the red noise stochastic uh, sources. The three major contributors there is the Wander in the neutron star rotation rate, which is known as spin noise. Now, I said pulsars have very stable rotation rate, but the uh, stability is a relative term. Okay? They are stable, but the rotation rate does stochastically as a random process vary. And that itself is, is uh, covariant with 
So that's been my speech today. I have already told you and shown you an example of dispersion measure noise. So you need to remove that. That, that goes as new to the power minus 2. So again, GMRT is very good to sort of characterize this. And the latest uh, kid on the block is the scattering in ISM, which has never been taken into account. So Nanogra does not take that into account. PPTA has taken, started taking into an account after we combined with them. PPTA also is just uh, starting to take this into account. This is a much stronger function of PPTC, new to the power minus 4.4. So all of these have variations over months and years and so on. And the gravitational wave, remember, also has variation over months and uh, years and so on. So this red noise uh, in the tiny residuals is covariant with gravitational wave. And what is worse is that it is much more dominant compared to the gravitational wave. The gravitational wave itself is a stochastic red noise process. So you need to remove this before you can actually start probing the gravitational wave. Uh, I'll probably skip the details of the technical aspect here. So usually you do this by uh, sort of uh, proposing what are known as Gaussian random processes. Okay? And you constrain these Gaussian random processes by uh, some kind of a Bayesian analysis in which you put some priors on your model and then use the data to uh, and calculate the likelihood and get the posterior of that. For the red mice part, you do that by decomposing the red mice into a Fourier basis with several Fourier uh, coefficients. And where the power spectral density of these Fourier coefficients is given by a form like this, where gamma is the spectral index of that red mice and the amplitude is at a given particular frequency, the amplitude of it. So you have a spectral model and you divide the red mice into several Fourier rings in each bin. You find out uh, the amplitude as well as the, uh, by combining all of them together, you get the, uh, the spectral index of that. Now, that is for spin noise, in, which is achromatic, that is, it is not a function of frequency. But the DMN scattering noise is actually not achromatic, it's a function of frequency. So, you add another frequency term to that with the index chi, which could be 2, 4.4, or 3, depending on what kind of chromatic noise you are wanting. So again, I'm not going to the details of this, but essentially, this is how you do the noise modeling. And we did that noise modeling for our NPTA data, and these are for two pulsars, 1643 minus 1224 and 1939 plus 2134. Uh, for those of you who are interested, you can go ahead and read in uh, Amar Shirastov's paper on this particular thing, just published recently. So the, in these noise models, this is the spin, uh, this is the spin noise, this is the dispersion measure noise, and this is the scattering noise. And it is this part where we are really unique. And for the first time, we are providing this. And actually, with this noise model, we can make many more pulsars or clocks amenable for people. So most PTAs, what they will do, they don't know this. Okay, so they will throw away the pulsar because it's a problem to deal with that pulsar. In fact, uh, Shri Bulgarni and Don Becker's Pulsar 1939 plus 21 supposed to be the best clock once upon a time. It is not included in many of the PTAs of course, because of precisely this. Okay. And the GMRT data actually gives you a handle to bring this Pulsar back to its original glory. It's the second fastest in the second Pulsar, one of the best clocks. Okay, so these posterior distributions, if you visualize them in time domain, this is how the visualization looks like. So you can see typically two to five microseconds is just coming from various. So this, what is plotted here is for two pulsars, the spin mice contribution, that is the achromatic mice contribution, which is which has come from that Bayesian analysis, which I mentioned earlier. And you can see that already few microseconds is coming from this. So you need to actually remove this from your tiny residuals before you can even start looking for the gravitational wave. Accurate models are important because otherwise this signal will leak into your gravitational wave and will corrupt your estimation of gravitational wave. And I think for the first 10 or 15 years of the PTA experiment, that is from 2004 to about 2016 and so on, these things limited the precision of the PTAs. And now we have a much better handle for these things. Can I ask? Yeah. So, do I understand correctly? So, we have a Gaussian process model is constraining. 
the particular realization of this dispersion noise that is expected. Yes. This particular data. Yes. That's why you can then point by point somewhere. Yes. So, so essentially, what it is doing is it's giving you the variation over long term, where of course you will have thousand realizations coming from the version process. But since you have the data and the posteriors are coming from the Bayesian analysis, you are constraining that at each of the measurement points fairly accurately. So I can say that at a given measurement point, how much of the contribution is coming from dispersion anywhere, how much is coming from scattering, and how much is coming from the spin noise. What I'm not able to understand is how does the Gaussian process then not end up modeling the signal itself if the signal is also a red spectrum? So that's the Agreed. So that's where the correlation comes in. So here, what we are doing is what we call a single pulsar noise analysis. So this is for each pulsar. And it is that's why the pulsar term is neglected. These are not, as you can see in this case, there are two particular uh, visualizations. They are not correlated. Okay. So the correlation between the noise sources for different, because this is a different line of sight, 900, 101.2. So the correlation for these pulsar noises will be zero. So you are not worried about that. But nevertheless, you need to remove this because unless you remove that, the correlated noise, which is the gravitational wave background, will not be seen. So, uh, okay, so in fact, you have motivated the next thing. So, your gravitational wave background itself is a red noise process. And again, you do it on a Fourier basis. So, you have a Fourier basis like that. And again, you have an amplitude and a spectral index of that. And you have these hyperparameters. So, it depends how many. Fourier bins you want to do. So even that is a parameter here. So in the case of our joint data set, the EPT and NPTA joint data set, we used typically 50 bins. Now, how do you actually calculate how many bins you do? Again, you run a Bayesian analysis. So you start with say 10 bins or 15 bins and 20 bins and do a model selection. You look for the evidence and find which gives you the best evidence and then choose that number of bins. So that is what has been done here. 50 and 50 bins have been used, and uh, which corresponds to 24 years of data. And again, the uh, it's the data span which will determine how many bins you get. So your lowest frequency is one by the total uh, time of the data span. Now, when you uh, if effectively when you get out your uh, covariance matrix here, you will have two terms. One would be a cell term which is what is giving you the common red noise across all the pulsars, but it's a cell term. It's not correlated in that sense. And the diagonal elements will give you cross correlations between different pulsars, and they give you cross correlations at different frequencies. So you can average these and uh, find the posterior distribution for each of the spectral bit and uh, sort of uh, find a correlation, average correlation over all the spectral bits and then plot it as a function of the separation of the sums to check if it is correlated in the same form as the HD correlation function. One thing which I want to sort of highlight here is that the, this kind of an analysis requires significant amount of compute time. So you cannot do this on normal computers. You need supercomputers for doing this. And uh, that is a major limiting factor, not just for us, it is also a major limiting factor for Australians, Americans, and Europeans. So when we started doing this analysis two years back, we looked around in the country and we found two very nice uh, CDAC wind clusters, Param Ganga and Param Seva, one at IIT Roorkee and one at IIT Hyderabad. And uh, we used, so uh, thanks to IIT Roorkee and Hyderabad, we were able to run this analysis of those clusters. We still need, need to improve the compute uh, times here, as, as I listed there, it can take up to a month just to run one particular search, which means that you can't actually test out many different models. So one reason why Nanogram has not put in other models is because you can only do so much in a year's time. If you want to publish paper in one year, well, you'll be happy with whatever analysis you have done. <laughs> so here we are now looking for true parallelization. So one problem in patient analysis is that the samples can't be very easily parallelized. There is a new algorithm called BB, which I think some people have used here in IOTA. So I would be very happy to uh, learn from them how to use that. That could actually improve the computation time significantly. So I just wanted to highlight that a significant computation for this has been done here uh, with the input. Okay, so let me now finally 
Well, I'm almost out of time, but let me just come to the final results. So this was the status uh, in 2020. So last time I gave a colloquium, which was online uh, about a year, two years back. Uh, this is the last slide which I had flashed in the point of time, where the nanograph, uh, BPTA, EPTA, and the IPTA's combined results were published. And they had, for the first time, announced a significant detection of a common red noise process. That is, this spectrum was, for the first time, having a base factor which could be called as few signal to noise ratio. Okay. So that was the first thing. And also, in their uh, different uh, spectral uh, fits, they were able to get a spectral index which is close to 13 by 3. And as I said earlier, this 13 by 3 is in the tiny residual domain. So if you translate it to the characteristic chain, it comes to 2 by 3. So this is the same as 2 by 3. So that is what had come. But at that point of time, no spatial correlation, no significant evidence for spatial correlation was there. So you could say that, well, you have, you have some evidence for gravitational wave background, but it's not concluded. So that was in 2020. And of course, we were not there at that point of time in the sense that our data, this was up to 2018 data. So our data was just beginning. We joined uh, as an associate member, IPTA in 2018. So, post these publication of the results, we also said that we will contribute in, in these searches. And one of the reasons which we told other PTAs why PTA data is important is that we are the only PTA providing data between 300 to 500 megahertz. So, when we add our data, it will certainly add value. That time we did not know that whether it will add value or not, but we did sort of put that argument because we fill a critical gap in the data sets of all of them. And the other PTA experiment were happy to sort of include us. And NPTA actually became a full member in 2021 of the IPT. And from then on, we are actually contributing to all the IPT assets. So our argument was that we are in the best position to provide this. And these are critical to, to the sensitivity of all the PTA experiments. Now, around the same time, different PTA experiments and the IPTA decided that the next data release or the next results of the search will be a coordinated publication in what is known as a 3P plus process. So since we didn't have a time baseline, we had to join a PTA and we chose European Pulsar Timing Array. The reason was that EPTA lost uh, Westerberg Synthesis Radio Telescope in 2016. It no longer does low frequency observation. And since then, they didn't have any low frequency observation. And even before 2016, their sensitivity from WSRT was not much. So by adding the NPTA data from GMRT between 300 to 500, we were giving them orders of magnitude higher sensitivity data, which would have benefited the EPTA uh, 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 search for gravitational waves. So that was an attractive point for me. For us, the attractive point was that we had only a baseline of four years, which was not sufficient to sort of look for gravitational wave, as opposed to a 25-year baseline. So both NPT and EPT decided to jointly search for gravitational waves in the three business process. And this is what we got, the results which in the next uh, four or five slides, I will present the results of our joint work. So the two data sets were combined, and they were analyzed for noise processes for individual pulsars, the single pulsar noise analysis. And what we thought, what was a gut feeling, actually turned out to be true. So here is an example of the posteriors, where the first two of these corner plots are for the spin noise, and the last two are for the dispersion measure noise, which is the ISM noise. Okay. The gray-colored posteriors are the posteriors for pulsar 1744 minus 4134 for the EPTA data alone. That is data only from EPTA without any EPTA contribution. The blue ones are the ones where the EPTA and EPTA data were combined. As you can see from these posteriors, the EPTA alone data, first of all, had bimodality, which obviously was an artifact. And also, where for the case of DM, they were much wider posteriors. By adding EPTA data, we resolved that uh, bimodality and we had much well constrained posteriors. So, in other words, the visualization or the time realization which I showed on the Gaussian process became much more precise. And that sort of feeds into the sensitivity of the gravitational wave. <coughs> so, 
we provided ISM mice models to uh, improving the ability to remove the noise and smice, which mimics gravitational wave from the combined DR2 from this data set. And the fact that this happens for many pulsars, not just for one pulsar, so we also quantitatively demonstrated by one of our PhD students, so we did Gunpur from PIFR, who used a new tensiometer way of doing comparisons between different posteriors to find out tensions between the EPTA alone posterior versus EPTA plus EPTA posterior. So this RN, RN is one of them is EPTA and one is EPTA plus EPTA, similarly DN. The bold phase figures are telling you tension. So you can already see this is, there are four pulsars where there was significant tension. Anything above two to three sigma is a significant tension as in terms of the tensiometer. So obviously these models needed to be improved to be able to improve the ability to uh, get the gravitational waves. And this is a major contribution from NPTA in the joint analysis of the two data sets. Also, as I said, we looked, we ran gravitational wave background search on the Param Ganga and Param Seva in IIT Roorkee and IIT Parabar to, uh, to get both the common red noise as well as the correlations. And uh, uh, we, uh, so while the EPTA ran on the EPTA alone data set, we ran on the joint data set. And we did a comparison of the results to see. So in some sense, our experiment had some redundancy in the sense that there was one data set which was EPTA alone, and there was another data set which was a joint data set. And we could do consistency check between the results of the two data sets. As long as we get consistent results, we are much more confident that the numbers which we are reporting are reliable and robust numbers. So that, that kind of analysis we did. This is just the, uh, the two things which I talked about. One is the spectrum, okay, and the other is the spatial coordination. So as I said uh, in the middle of the talk, that to be able to say that I have detected gravitational wave background, I need to show that I get a spectrum which is 13 by 3. And I also need to see a spatial coordination. What are plotted here are violins. Each violin represents the posterior distribution for a given separation. So what you do is you take, so you have 25 pulsars, so you have 25 C2 combinations. Then you bin all of them into angular separation bins. And uh, then you work out the posterior for each of the bin. And that is what the violin is. The gray shaded histogram here is telling you how, how many number of pairs have gone into that. And you can see there is a very reasonable coverage of the entire and it's a non curve in that. And there are two plots there, one is a blue one and one is an orange one. The <coughs> blue one was the full 25 year data set, whereas the orange one is a smaller nine year data set. The 24 year data set had a lot of old backends, a lot of instrumental bias. So we don't see as good an evidence for gravitational wave background in the full data set, but we do see a much well constrained three to three and a half sigma uh, evidence for gravitational wave background with the spatial correlation for the nine year or the 10 year uh, data set, which basically is uh, from say uh, uh, 2010 to 2020, that kind of uh, space. The interesting thing to note here is that the full data set is more consistent by th with 13 by 3 spectra, whereas the newer data set, which is more significant, is not. And this is one of the tensions, which has, which is not just true for EPTA plus EPTA data, but is also true for the other PTAs. And this actually opens uh, fresh questions about the nature of the gravitational wave background which we see. Is it all because of an incoherent sum of an ensemble of supermassive black hole values or not? And I'll come to that later. Of course, the two different type of data set, the Bayesian analysis produced consistent results. And this was also tested in terms of tensiometer uh, plots, which is shown here. And again, you, you sort of recover uh, gravitational wave amplitude, which is of the order of uh, log amplitude is of the order of minus 14.48 and so on and so forth. So assuming that this is a detection, this is the first time that you have a number for the gravitational wave amplitude, which was not there earlier. Previously, there were only limits. So th these are the main results from our paper, but at the same time when we published this paper on June 29, the other PTA experiments also made coordinated publication. A total of 18 papers were published on that day on astro -PH. 
and they have published their own individual results. So I'll very quickly go through their results to show similarities and differences from ours. The nanograph paper's main result is that it also shows that uh, you have a common noise across all the pulsars, and now this is over 67 pulsars, ours was 25. And that has a signal to noise ratio of seven, a base factor as large as 10 to the power 14 and so on. So this is in continuation of 2020 paper, where this was first detected. Now the significance of this has become much, much larger. In addition to that, they report a uh, helix and down significance, which is uh, depending on the method which you have used, Bayesian or frequentist, is between three to four sigma sort of a detection. And the amplitude, which is consistent, so basically, all these three results are similar to the results which we got from the EPTA and EPTA data sets. There are other uh, interesting things in that, that the spectral index is in mild tension with 13, which is similar to our results. And this sort of indicates that the source of the background could be things other than supermassive black hole. So I'll come to this a little later. There's also an interesting thing there that the different types of Dispersion measure models which you used uh, showed that maybe the model which they are using is not the most correct model. And that's where I think the FDA low frequency data combining with, uh, with the nanograph would actually sort of improve the sensitivity. But most importantly, they showed for the first time that the signal to noise ratio is growing with time. And that is an expectation which the entire PTA community has had. If you have a background, your noise is much higher. As you collect over longer and longer baseline, more and more signals, your signal to noise ratio should slowly increase. So, your gravitational wave background should slowly emerge out of the noise. That is the expectation in very simple words, and that is what they actually showed. Okay. That is shown in this particular plot, where from six year data release to today, they have shown the signal to noise ratio really sort of increasing. <clears throat> This is, uh, so I'll not go into all of the plots. This is the spectrum. This is again the Hellings and Downs curve, which as I said is three sigma and so on. This is a plot which is of importance to EPTA because it shows two different types of DM models which they have used. One is called as a GMX model and one is called as a DM Gaussian process model. They show that uh, for the two models, there is a mild tension between the two models. And it appears that the DM Gaussian process model seems to be better. Now, in their actual analysis for three, three and a half sigma, they have actually not used this model. They have used only DMX model. The DMGP was an afterthought because the EPT and PPTA is using it. So they put it at a later point of time. But the very fact that there is a tension here shows that the DMs which they have used are not as precise or as accurate as should have been. And maybe Despite having larger number of pulsars in their PTA, despite having a very long time baseline, their significance is only four sigma. Maybe if they had better DMs, they probably could have crossed the canonical five sigma. PPTA also announced their results, and again there are similarities and differences. The similarities are that the significance is there, but is much lower. They only get a two sigma. The amplitude is similar to the other two PTAs. And in general, the signal looks to be consistent with others, except that the significance is not as high. But there are important differences. <laughs> this was the only PT experiment which did a unique way of looking at their uh, data. They divided their 18, and this has the longest time span, 18 weeks. So they divided their 18 year data into six year slices, start from beginning to end, and nine year slices. And they find a very odd thing that. The earlier six years, they get an upper limit. And in the later part of their uh, data sets, they actually detect gravitational wave. The amplitude of the detected gravitational wave is in tension with the upper limit. Okay. They don't understand this. So in the paper, they say that maybe it's not a stationary process. Maybe this whole thing is changing, but that's just a speculation. Okay. And that is the time dependence which is shown. Sorry. Too fast. <laughs> That is the time dependence which is shown here in this particular plot. These two are the same plots, uh, the spectrum and the HD correlation and so on and so forth. Again, details of these, these are all published now, at least on AstroPH, if not actually in the press. 
So you can go and read the details of the paper. There are many other details which I have skipped through, right? So because I'm only concentrating on the main results of the paper. So this is a very interesting analysis. And no other PTI has done that. So for all you know, we may find something similar in nanogram and so on and so forth. So it's very interesting now. Okay, so first thing is what do these results mean? First of all, this is the first time in the last two decades that there is a significant detection of common spectrum with some spectral index close to 13 by 3, not exactly 13 by 3, but close to 13 by 3, with a very high significance, signal to noise ratio of 7 and 8. So it's beyond doubt that the common spectrum is there. In 2020, it was still a bit doubtful, but now that is beyond doubt. This is also the first time that there is a spatial correlation which has been detected with three signals. In the 3P plus process, which Sandeep was also part of the detection committee, our goal was to achieve five sigma before calling it a detection. Of course, the press doesn't care what is three and five sigma. We have not achieved five sigma. So I just want to say a word of caution that I would not call this as a strong evidence. I would still call it as an emerging evidence of that. We are yet to reach five sigma. We are close to five sigma, but we are not five sigma. Yes. <laughs> so you are not alone. Say in 300 odd PTA community, there are 150 people who say like that, 150 the other way around. I would still like to be a bit cautious. So, so the essential thing is, in any case, looking at the nanograph plot of emerging evidence, I think another two years we will reach five sigma. So in that sense, we have opened a new window in the gravitational wave spectrum, which is very good because now it's like radio and visible in electromagnetic spectrum. What took 300 years, we have done it in okay. But more importantly, the origin of the gravitational wave background is now in question because as, as I said here, uh, uh, in, in all those plots earlier also, okay. <coughs> so there is this tension. Okay. So this is, this is what you expect of a background which is coming from supermassive black hole batteries. But although it is not excluded by this post-posterior, the 60%, 65%, 68% uh, confidence limit, but nevertheless, uh, the highest confidence contour is not sitting on that. So there is a tension, and if you actually calculate the tension meter, there is a significant tension. So maybe there are other ways of generating gravitational wave background which are not by... Uh, supermassive black hole binary. And I think that door is now left open as a that's a new question which we need to answer going forward. As I've already mentioned, the Parks pulsar timing array is saying is sort of hinting whether there is a time dependence and we don't know that. Uh, the significance itself is not the same in all the three PTAs and the Parks PTA is giving a lower significance. Now, that could be because Parks looks at southern hemisphere, so the pulsar which it looks at are very different from the northern hemisphere pulsars. But does that mean there is an anisotropy in the background? Okay. So, there are lots of new questions which have started coming up, and only a longer time baseline will not only form the detection to 5 sigma, but also start a path for meaningful astrophysics. And as, as I showed the spectrum earlier, longer baseline means you are probing lower and lower frequencies. So, if you believe in astrophysical models where the last parsec problem with the binary evolution is there, then the spectrum should actually flatten and turn off. So, for that, you need another four or five years of uh, data to be able to say, say that. So, uh, there are lots of things which you can do later on. But more importantly, in the last two months or so, as part of IPTA, we are actually sitting together and comparing the three results and trying to see if these results are consistent or inconsistent. And we are doing, this is very difficult to do because each PTA has a different methodology. They have used a different number of Fourier bits to model the gravitational wave background. Their noise models are completely independent of each other. So uh, apple to apple comparison is very difficult. But nevertheless, we have used the tension metric, and again, IPTA, a team of almost six or seven young students from IPTA, has, uh, from IPTA, has actually contributed in uh, com computing these tension metrics. So we have used the comparison of posteriors using this uh, tension metric, and a hybrid approach of having a standardized noise model across the PTAs, 
has been applied to try and see if we can get a better signal if we combine all of them. Uh, this is still work in progress, not yet uh, completed. But the preliminary results is that in few pulsars, the noise models, there is tension between one PTA to another PTA to another PTA. So again, there is scope, and especially in DM, again, there is a scope where PTA can contribute. And, but overall, the posterior distribution for gravitational wave background are consistent within one sigma as calculated by the tension. So broadly, the three PTAs are giving consistent results. I think that is the take home message. But there are minor differences which only tell you that maybe if you do things better, you may get a higher significance. The next big step as the time goes by is to combine now these three data sets. So, what was announced in June 29 papers were the results of the analysis of the individual data sets. Now, right now, we are going through a phase which is known as early data release 3, IPTA EDR3, in which 25 best pulsars have been selected. And the data from nanogram EPTA, NPTA, PPTA, plus meerkat data, so there is one more telescope which has got added, is being combined together to try and see if we can get a higher significance than what we got from individual EPTA. And again, uh, uh, about 115 pulsars will be involved in this exercise, and about one fourth of these pulsars will be analyzed locally here as part of the PTA. So, this is our part of our international. So, we are now pulling our data together to create a 115 pulsar PTA with 20 year time baseline, and this will include new data also. So, the data which I showed is up to 2020, three years have elapsed. Even the NPTA data has uh, advanced. So we will add more data and we'll get a 20 plus year time baseline. The nice modeling, which we learned a lot in the last three years, we are going to improve all those, uh, include all those improvements in our noise modeling. And of course, this whole data set will be very useful to try and detect an individual supermassive black hole binary, which would be very useful because if we do detect one, then the hypothesis of uh, the background coming from super individual super some of supermassive black hole binaries could be valued. And as I said, the sensitivity of all PTAs is just on the border. In the earlier slide, I showed that it's just on the border for an individual supermassive black hole binary. The sensitivity of the combined data set should be lower than that. So there is hope that we can actually get that. Uh, and of course, uh, some work which is going on in NPTA theoretically, is to model these waveforms, the burst with memory. And these are like transients. So if we are lucky in the 20-year data, somewhere we can find a transient here. So there's a lot of things which are uh, still in progress. And of course, after these papers have come, there have been thousands of approaches on various theoretical fronts, which I'm not an expert in, so I will not comment at all. Uh, so all those different pieces of work are also undergoing under the IPTS things. So this is my uh, summary and I will sort of, since I'm already way beyond my time, I'll be here. Thanks, Vajra, for a very nice and talk on this exciting area. So, okay, I'll see you first. I have two questions. One is slide 44 again, the pilot. Yes, I wanted to understand why the new data set you are saying is not the one which is kind of your uh, main data set. Main one. Very good question. One would naively expect that blue data set is 24 years of this time. So you should get the best results there because the signal would be good there. In the initial days, that's what we thought. But last year in October, we found that in Nancy Radio Telescope, the clock which is used to measure the pulse arrival time actually jitters up and down. So they had some very uh, strange mechanism of time transfer from Paris, where is the local observatories there, to Nancy. And uh, there was some problem with the radio. So this clock jittered quite. And that was what was creating the problem. So all the Nancy data was thrown away. There is a huge amount of data because John Becker started way back in 97, 98 from Nancy. And Nancy actually does only this experiment, nothing else. But nevertheless, that didn't, uh, and the reason for uh, localizing that flock data was because we are seeing a very strong monopole. 
and uh, in 21 22 there was a feeling that maybe this monopoly is nothing systematic but is actually coming from a individual source in the sky so one had to go through a process of elimination to find the block then that data was removed but even after removing that data it did not improve the significance and our significance was much lower than even the past significance so then the question came why is so and somebody said uh, so the box people they actually started doing that six year nine year slices here the compute power was not available so we didn't have the luxury they had cinema so Matthew Wales had a huge supercomputer we didn't have so we had the only option to divide the data into a small chunk and a big chunk and lo and behold when we took the 10 year slice the significance just boomed up so the question was that what is different between the old and the new data set so new data set, as I said, is all after 2010. Much of the earlier data set, 1995 to 2005, was using something known as incoherent dispersion, where the dispersive effect in the pulse uh, in the pulse are not completely. And this is old journal data and other data. So obviously there are a lot of telescope-related artifacts in there. After 2004-2005, there is coherent dispersion data, but again the backends kept changing. And uh, it, people were not, at least the people in the observatories were not very confident whether the, uh, the data which you have does not have instrumental artifacts. So that could be one of the major reasons why the significance is so different. There could be other reasons also. The monopole has not vanished. It is still there in both our and nanograv data. Nanograv did similar kind of thing. They had a monopole in the early days. So they divided, they take data from GBT and Arecibo telescope. So they divided their data into two sets, Arecibo and GBT. They found that uh, the monopole has a reduced signature and I think some amount of noise modeling was also getting into the problem. So there were issues like that. And uh, eventually when Parks people came up with six year slices and they saw a very good, uh, even in six year data, they saw a very nice uh, bump up. And I didn't mention fast in past work. Uh, PTA which produced that, they have only three years of data and they claim uh, four sigma detection, which is a bit doubtful, but nevertheless, uh, if such a small data set can still give you a detection, then obviously the instrument is playing some role in the longer timelines. Okay, uh, I think uh, TP, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you for a very nice talk. So I had two small related questions, and towards the end, you mentioned uh, uh, ongoing effort to detect the first individual supermassive binary. And so, could you kindly come in to what uh, kind of work is involved in that? And also, you said to rule out a cosmological yeah. origin. So, what kind of cosmological source would it be which could produce this signal? Okay, so again, I am not an expert in this, so let me preface by that, because I am a galactic person. Uh, cosmology, I have gone into because of PT. But you have scenarios like uh, cosmic superstring. Cosmic strings are probably ruled out, but cosmic superstrings are still there. You have inflation, and you have ultralight dark matter. So there are these three possibilities. And uh, again, I am not an expert in that. Uh, but people can tweak these models to get the 13 by 3 uh, kind of a uh, spectral index. So those could be the cosmological things. About mm -hmm. the individual supermassive black hole binary system, uh, it depends on what kind of galaxy evolution models you are talking about. So this number is very uncertain because it depends on the galaxy surveys and uh, also on the, on the masses inferred of the black holes in many of the galaxies known. And those masses are inferred using various scaling relations, like pulse uh, relations and so on. And many of them have uncertainties in, in the entire thing. So actual number density and uh, residence time, which is what decides the spectrum. So as uh, I think uh, Shyanand also mentioned, the amplitude would depend on the occupation function and the evolution scenario of these supermassive black hole binaries. That is very uncertain. So because of that, it is very difficult to sort of uh, uh, say whether you can actually detect an individual supermassive black hole binary system. 
but a naive calculation like the one which i showed you which is uh, uh, which is calculating the strain for a gravitationally uh, gravitational radiation dominated in spiral the number is somewhere just on the border of the pta sensitivity so if you are lucky we should be able to detect continuous wave from a supermassive black hole binary system and uh, maybe our noise models need to be tuned properly or maybe we need to sort of do something in our analysis that we are just missing that. so that uh, bullet point was essentially for that that uh, going ahead with advanced analysis it is and with the full sensitivity of the pta data set it is quite possible that we might be actually able to detect the uh, first individuals for massive black hole detection of that would mean that such binaries exist see right now there is no candidate where you have direct observational proof so you need a observational proof once you know that then you apply the galaxy evolution model you can actually try and tweak the spectrum or the spectral index to match what we have right now there is a tension the cosmology aspect as i said there are few possibilities but uh, i i am not qualified to speak on any of them. so i i can send you some papers on that yeah thank you and but primordial supermassive black hole binaries are also a possible inflation relic is that yes. okay okay thank yes. you thank you very much thank no, no, you you are, you are very correct and actually that is even better because that's the place where ligo and pta come into picture so if you want to do multi band gravitational wave astronomy the linkage is through primordial black holes in the inflationary side so mm. yeah. also lisa 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 in between ji thank you thank you uh, shashwat there is one more person who has raised hand on the uh, online sanjeev sanjeev has that is there right ah okay maybe i'll come after uh, sanjeev yeah i am not there unfortunately to attend your lecture in person so <laughs> uh, you know everything so i, I don't think i need to tell you you have been involved in the process all so it's okay no i just wanted to know that uh, since uh, jbrt is looking at 6 to 14 pulsars you have 6 to 14 uh, lines of sights line of sights uh, for this 14 pulsars is that enough to map out the uh, electron density in the interstellar medium no it is not and even for the lc correlation it is not you know oh, yeah. so we have been trying to integrate the sample to take it so it's a tension with the time allocation committee uh, oh. they actually rejected our proposal in 2019 and uh, then uh, we had to go down to 6 and then slowly we have been increasing so we are now is 24 which is a respectable mm-hmm. number Uh, yes. I hope that uh, with this uh, we will this time we will get more time. I don't know. So, but you are right that it is not enough. Actually, even twenty thirty is not good enough to map the ISM. But I think everybody should be interested in that. I mean, what about the I mean nanogram and everybody to get the good uh, you know model of the dispersion medium. Uh, I mean, I, I agree. I agree hundred percent with you, but. how to convince uh, jita that they should give us uh, 500 hours you know so really yeah. okay okay thank you very good talk okay sashwat yeah uh, is there a, an intuitive way of understanding how increasing the number of pulsars in the future signals the correlation how increasing the observation time the signal For observation time, is it as simple as square root of time as it is for continuous wave, or is it more complicated? No, no. So uh, it's more complicated. So first of all, there is a pre-detection sensitivity curve and post-detection. They have different slopes, and uh, since time is short, so there is a paper by Siemens et al. 2013, I think, which discusses the scaling relations for sensitivity with respect to number of pulsars, and there is also the cadence. So right now all PTAs are observing once in fourteen days. But if you are able to observe once every day, your sensitivity jacks up like anything. So both the total number of pulsars in the array as well as the cadence, they play a role in uh, in the signal to noise ratio which you get. The signal to noise ratio which you get pre detection has a steeper slope than post detection, and the details of How this has to be calculated and so on are there in that uh, Harvey Singh paper. I I have I have exactly this question because how to 
scale, like where you can cross five sigma. So there was a plot which you showed, but it started from negative as an so I could not scale it. <laughs> I did not understand what was going on. But yes, before, before, uh, yeah, this one. This, yeah. Ah, See? Yes. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's, I think, uh, uh, these are all upper limits. Okay. So, frankly speaking, none of this up to here, 12 years, is, uh, is anything of significance. These are all the politics. This <coughs> is a sort of cheating in the sense that uh, you have to show it's evolving out. Okay, so, so, 12 years is the first time when they had a reasonable signal to noise ratio for the common red noise process, right. where, where you can believe this kind of thing. So, uh, around uh, one and a half to two sigma kind of thing. So, <laughs> all these numbers, I, I also don't know how they sort of. Yes. These are all posteriors coming from some analysis of theirs, which are all posteriors for the upper limits. These Bayesian things are really difficult to understand. I just wanted to complete my question. So, yeah. uh, if I were to compare number of pulsars versus amount of observation time, which would you say helps more? So, if I double the number of pulsars, would that help, or if I double the observation anyway. time? So, uh, one clarification there observation time is not important. Cadence is cadence. Because you can observe a pulsar for 15 minutes or one hour. That has some other implication, but uh, it's the number of times you are observing in a year which is important. So, cadence is important. So, uh, and again, the second assumption which you should keep in mind is that we are, we are assuming all pulsars are ideal blocks. They have no spin noise, they have no DM noise, they have nothing to that. If that is the case, the number of pulsars would uh, win over the cadence. Which is also good in some sense because no observatory is going to give you delicate. So, so ideally speaking, if you can observe a large number of pulsars, even once every 14 days, the total total observation time which you will require will be less than observing a smaller number of pulsars, but every day. But typically, like it goes as in square root of n or it is about one fourth. Uh, I don't exactly remember the functional form from the Siemens et al. paper. Uh, it does not uh, go as so. It, uh, see, there's also the question of the distribution. So uh, it depends on the number of bins. It will go as uh, the uh, the uh, square root of n if you are adding in the same bin. Right. Okay. So. Uh, so it's it's a little more complicated than doing that, especially for the special special correlation. For the common red noise process, yes, it will increase uh, in the typical way, but that we are we already have seven sigma. So I don't think that's a big issue. The more important issue is the spatial correlation. So spatial correlation then depends on in every bin how many of these uh, the how how high is the shade. So right now they are. Uh, many of the far away bins are in the Poisonian. Okay, so you, you have uh, Poisonian errors here. But uh, especially for uh, EPTA plus NPTA and for BPTA. Because we have very small number, 25 persons. Whereas for uh, nanogram, they have 67 C2. So they are much better off than, than us. But again, it depends on uh, how many pairs are going into and how good is the distribution. So the other third factor which is important in that is how well distributed are the pulsars across the sky? So, if you have all thousand pulsars in one direction, that doesn't matter. Okay, okay. Now, yeah, we should stop now. I mean, it was, of course, very exciting. Well, let's thank Walter again. For yes, that's okay. <laughs> Recording stopped. Uh, <laughs>